Hey, good morning. Thanks for being here today. Really excited about uh, this morning. Uh, why don't you stand, say hi to somebody around you. Um, we're just so glad to be here, and uh, we're going to start with a song this morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here. I'm going to get started with some announcements here. Oh, actually, we do have a video.
How cool is that? That was from our kids' art program. Hope you had a chance to come out and see that. Uh, if you didn't, you're going to get another chance because we're doing another arts program in the first week of August. So if you missed out and didn't get to see it, or if kids, if you weren't there and want to do it again, early in August, we're going to do it again. So watch for signups for that. Good morning, Alive Church. How are you? Good morning, Facebook, everybody. Glad to see you here. Glad you could join us. We have some announcements. First, safety for seniors. I uh, mentioned in the last couple of weeks or so, if you are a senior and you want to be safe and learn how to do that, whether you're at home or out and about shopping, what have you, or even online, our own Dennis and Natalie Sheldon will be giving a Safety for Seniors seminar, which is put on by our Young at Hearts Ministry. Thank you to them. When is that? It is Thursday morning, this coming Thursday morning at 10.30 to 11.30. Doors open at 10.15. It's going to be great info to stay safe. If you'd like to be part of that, please call us at 708-634-8448 and let us know that you're coming. We want you to help us clean up. We, <laughs> work day is coming. Actually, it's really fun day because if you've ever been part of one, it is a ton of fun. You get to hang out with each other, do some, do some fun working around, some, paint, uh, uh, some painting, some cleaning. Uh, again, coffee and donuts. If no other reason to come out, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's going to start at 9 o'clock, Coffee and Donuts, 9 o'clock. Uh, please sign up to be part of one of the teams. Right in the back, there's a blue table back there to sign up. There's a bunch of different teams that you can be a part of. Some of the teams are painting. There's an attic and backroom clean-out team. Uh, just general cleaning team to wipe chairs down, make sure everything looks spick and span. Um, and if you like working outdoors, there's a landscape team as well. So um, these are seriously a lot of fun. So come out and help us out with that. Uh, that is, again, May 22nd, Saturday, uh, 9 a.m. till noon. Guys, steak night. Mr. Mark has some message to us for about Mike's steak, uh, our men's steak night. Come on up, Mark. Let us know all about that. Here's Mark, everybody. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Uh, uh, a live church will be hosting the men's steak night, which occurs on the 25th of May, Tuesday, starting at 6.30 p.m. and ending at 8 p.m. The dinner includes a ribeye steak, baked potato, Texas toast, soda, and yet but not least water. So the cost of the dinner is $20, but all the guests you bring eat for free. So please bring more people, the more the merrier. And uh, there's, I don't know if there's a paper on the front desk to sign. There's been little cards I know floating around. You would fill it out, put it in the box. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. So it's $20, but if you bring a guest, it's free for them. So I'm thinking, I'm getting 20 guests, charging them each, each dollar. I'm coming for free. Just, 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 just. <laughs> All right, a couple more announcements before we uh, get started. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we will have a combined service. Our 9 o'clock and our 10.30 services are going to be together. Coffee and donuts again. Uh, starting at 10 o'clock in the cafe. Uh, what else do we want to know about that? We, um, let's see, oh, our coffee and donuts will be provided by our Tuesday morning life group and a grab-and-go cookout uh, that's going to be put on will be provided by our Wednesday morning men's group. So thank you to them uh, for hosting that. Please make plans to join us for that. Tons of tons of fun. We got a donation. Thanks to a $2,500 outside donation, we have the opportunity to match that gift uh, to get our own new chairs for the sanctuary here. Right? So thank you to that donor. It was amazing. Uh, the opportunity is to sponsor one or more chairs as we pray about reaching more people in Oak Lawn and the greater Chicagoland area. If you would like to be a part of that and to sponsor one or more chairs, uh, please contact Sheila Downer, and her email is not up there, but it is at sdowner, D-A-U-N-N-E-R, at livealivechurch.com. Uh, uh, that's not true. Here it is. S. Downer, D-A-U-N-N-E-R, at livealive.church. All right. And now, before we get started, if you please bow your heads as I say a prayer. Father, thank you for this day. 
and thank you for everyone that's within the sound of my voice. As we begin just one more day's journey closer to eternity, Father, please let the words that we hear today prepare our hearts and our souls for our arrival before your Son, Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you all please stand and continue singing with us today? Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, and I believe that you are my fortress, oh, you are my portion, and you are my hiding place, and I believe that you are the way. The truth, the life, and I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. Yeah, I believe in every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take. I believe that you are provider, and you are protector, you are the one I love, and I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, and I believe you are the way. The truth, the light, I believe you are. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today. With mercies that I knew All my fears and doubts They can all come to me Cause they can't stay long And I believe you are The way The truth And the life I believe you are The way The truth, the light. Amen. You are good, you are good, and there's nothing good in I love you, I love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all your sin. You are peace. You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling You are true, you are true Even in my wandering You are joy, you are joy In the reason that I sing You are life, you are life In you death has lost its sting into your arms the riches of your love will always be enough 
nothing compares to your embrace light up the world forever rain you are more and you are more and you are more than my words will ever say you are lord you are lord all creation will proclaim sit in this moment with you. God, thanks so much for for meeting us here in this place, being so present with us, being so real to us. We have life in your name, in no other name. We're so amazed by the way that you've made for us, the way to be restored to the Father, to be made whole in him, to know him as we know you, to believe in him, as we believe in you. Lord Jesus, continue to do just even greater things in us and here among us. Thank you for the hope that you've put in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. My heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will say no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will say no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will say no other name. Jesus, Jesus. Go ahead and have a seat. And uh, up next, we have the, the kids' spot today. Check this out. Hey, friends. Joe here. How is it going? Welcome to Sunday. Hope everyone's doing great. Um, a while back, 
uh, a relative of ours had passed away and the ceremonies involving his burial involved a church service at a church and then to come to a place like this to a small chapel and have a final small service there. And so the church service was finished and everyone got in their cars and they made their way to the cemetery to go to the chapel. Well, my sister and my cousin were driving together and they come up to the chapel, they park their car, they come to the chapel and they, they, see, they, they, they go in and they see a crowd of people and they very quietly, quietly, very, you know, gently enter into this crowd of people as the service begins. And they're just, you know, just there in the moment and they look around and they realize they don't know anybody here. It is a room of strangers. They are in the wrong part of the chapel and this is someone else's final ceremony. And so they very slowly, quietly back away and they go out into this little foyer and they just can't, they just can't hold it together. They see where, where they're supposed to be and they enter, but they enter just a little different. It's kind of like they enter like this that you remember in school, like when the guy next to you would just tell the best joke ever, right? And then as soon as he was done, the teacher walked in and you like, you just can't, you can barely keep it together. Teacher wants you to be serious and you're still thinking of the joke and you're like, oh. well, that's how they sort of entered this very solemn moment. And you know, they got a couple looks and we're like, what's going on? And so afterwards we're like, what is the deal? And they just burst out laughing and they tell this story and it's so funny. They were, they thought they were on the right way, but they were confused. They just didn't understand. And that really kind of makes me think about where we're at today uh, in verse 14 of John. Uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples. He's preparing his disciples for what's going to happen next. And when I say next, I mean uh, the cross and everything that that involves. And he knows it's going to be very difficult time. And he starts out verse 14 by, you know, do not let your hearts be troubled. And there's just so much good stuff in there. And his disciples are going like, yeah, okay. As he keeps talking, they're like, uh-huh. And they're like, he's going away. Where is he going? You see, they don't understand everything the way we understand it. It's all unfolding in front of their eyes. And so they're like, ah, this way, where are you going? You know, you're preparing a place. Where is this place? How do we get there? Uh, we don't even have GPS, you know. Um, and, and so Jesus, he just kind of sets them straight. And he's like, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. And to me, you know, when I was a really young Christian and reading his word and things are just, you know, um, some stuff makes sense, other stuff doesn't make sense. I came to this passage and it was like, wow, that makes sense. <laughs> we know the way to God. We know the way to heaven because Jesus is the way and he is the truth. This is for real and it's real and truthful. And he is the life. This is not all about, you know, what happens here. It's what's happened today, you know? And so listen, you guys, my challenge to you guys is as a family, read chapter 14 and read it a couple times and there's just so much there and in verse 6 where he says I am the way the truth and the light just ponder that reality okay guys I gotta get going I'll see you guys later all right bye bye going on around Alive this week, so many different ways of doing church together, um, and just from the, the arts program, the video we watched earlier, wrapping up this week, to um, Saturday morning, the Exponential Conference going on, a lot of you were there, I know, um, just pretty amazing, um, seeing churches come together, seeing 
different people from our community and, and even from Grand Rapids being here for that event. Um, and then just Saturday night, Church Under the Bridge, the way that that's coming together and that's happening um, is just so incredible. And the life groups meeting throughout the week, um, just the, the meals we've shared together, just things going on um, that are just so cool. It's amazing the the all the different ways that we can be an expression of the church. There's so many different ways to do church, um, and Jesus is in all of them. And it's our um, unique calling and mission that contributes to what church is, but then it's when we do it together that it starts being church. It starts, like, really being church. And um, this next song we're going to sing is... Um, it's about Jesus, and it's about how he is the, the way, the truth, and the life, and he's the God who we worship that, that unites us. And um, we're, in Ephesians, it says that we're many parts of one body, that we're all distinctly different, and um, we're all made um, uniquely, but we need each other. We come together. That's what the body of Christ looks like. And so with this next song, let's just, uh, why don't we stand and... Um, we just want to glorify the God um, who, who does unite us.
my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Enter through the narrow gate, for it is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life and there are few who find it. Awesome service this morning, just coming together. I think some of it's off the heels of we're kind of uh, a lot of us, a lot of us in the room, and many people becoming a part of so much that's going on. But we're kind of on this rally from Friday and the art celebration and the showcase that happened into Saturday and the training that happened and coming together. And a lot, again, a lot of life is happening together because of those things. They're not the things, they're not the programs, but it's the life and the space that's creating for relationship and relationship with us and figuring out what it means to be the body of Christ. Like Ronald's saying, each of, our, each of us being a part of a whole. That's a powerful story, the power of the church, the power of people knowing what their unique part is and then being that and then being together to be that in this world. It, there's a reason the church is called the body of Christ because it's supposed to reflect him in this world. And how it reflects the, him in this world is when we're each our part and then we're together. And so we're together Friday and we're together Saturday morning and then we're together Saturday night for church under the bridge. A, a, a bunch of us are in a sense a core of us that you know God's really working in and moving in and then we're here today and again life groups are happening. We're what I would say in one sense, we're one of the leading churches for the percentage of lives in life groups that like attend on Sunday. Now, we're not a whole lot of numbers, but those of us that are, are a part are, are committed. We're, we're getting in, we're, we're playing the game called Be the Church, Be What God Calls Us to Be, take on that challenge of being the vision of being that body of Christ in our world by each of us figuring out what our part is and becoming a part of the whole and then reflecting. There's such power in that. There's such power in the church, being the church in this world. Not doing church or attending church, but our lives becoming that, becoming the body of Christ in this world so God's redemptive and his restoring and his rebuilding and his saving, that that work continues to unfold in our lives more and more and then the lives around us that God brings into his story. That's so powerful. The power of the church and the power of us living that out, you know, the way that God has designed it is amazing. Today we're continuing our series. We're week six, wrapping up next week of our walk through John, the book of John, because it's just a great book to read to get back to the basics of belief. Fundamentally, you could say that's what the book of John is all about, is about the power of belief. The power of belief in Christ in that Jesus is the Christ that he is. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. It's not like just Jesus the statue, Jesus the guy who died on the cross. That, and those are all powerful things, but like that makes him the Christ. And it's like our belief in that, us staking our lives on that being true, is like the power of life. It's the power of God in this world. And really, the degree to which we believe that is the degree to which the power that we then live that out, and then that's like the degree to which God's power is active in this world. It takes our lives, being the church, 
with this deep, this just deep belief that this is true, that so much is unleashed in our lives. The life change that happens is unleashed through our belief, and then the life change that happens through our lives and lives around us, and in the relationships, and in our marriages, in our homes, in our communities, in our future, in our plans, in our dreams, all that starts to be transformed. The book of John is all about that. That's why John wrote it about Jesus. That's why Jesus lived the life the way he lived it, so that we would know he is the Christ, and that through our belief in him, that we would find life in his name. That's the purpose of the book of John. And it's the hope of our lives, it's the hope of this world, and us getting that right is really important. It's kind of been, this has been a cool series because I've been by, surprised by some things through the series. And that's to me, like, that's a good series because it's just all of us together growing, discovering new things about Jesus. His word never gets old. It's always living and active if our lives have belief in it. If we believe in the power that it has and how it can bring life to our lives. But one of the things that has really like surprised me going through this is, A, just that power, it's belief. The degree to which you believe that and are, are convinced of that and how, how you walk that out every day is the power. And, and it's like kind of like, yeah, that's what the book of John's about. And that's why we kind of went through the book of John. But I'm like, no, but do we really get that? Do we get the difference of that? That's just surprising me of how basic that is, but how powerful that is. And then secondly, that the claims of Christ. I don't know. I've usually heard the I am statements in the book of John are like the bold claims of Jesus. And I, it's probably just in my head. But like a bold claim is like an aspirational thing that kind of you pound your chest and you say, I am this and I am that. And it's like a claim that you're making or that you're reaching for. And that's not what Jesus is doing in his I am statements at all. They're not bold claims. They're just powerful explanations so that our belief in him grows. That's, that's such a big difference. And I feel like we want them to be these um, bold claims and I find like the more we believe that, it like just becomes kind of religious. We want to be really convinced of some of these things. And it, so it's a bold claim versus no, it's a powerful explanation that could change uh, how we think of things or the degree to which we believe these things to be true. Jesus' I am statements are statements that explain who he is based on what was going on in the lives that he was with. And that's like our biggest application is to understand how is that true with what's going on in the life we're currently leading. What makes that relevant and brings that same kind of change and possibility to our lives. So it's based on what's going on in our lives. We're his followers now. And that ultimately Jesus' I am statements are these explanations of how you experience life in him and through him. And in him and through him and him alone to find what our hearts and our souls and our minds were created for, that kind of relationship with God where we know his love and forgiveness and mercy and purpose and power. Another thing that, this is so funny because I don't often use alliteration, same word starting with same letter to stick things in our minds, but the reality of this has just helped me through the course of this series that one of the first weeks it was all about God's presence and peace and his protection, his provision, his power, his promises, his providence and his perspective. Like That just sounds like a long list of P words that I might have tried to think of to get as many as I could, like it was some kind of icebreaker game. Ooh, that would be a fun icebreaker game sometime. But it's like that's life. That, that's the life we're invited into. That's how we come alive. It's through his presence in our lives. It's through his peace in our lives. Our belief in him and the life that it leads us to when we believe in his name, the life that we find in his name is his presence fills us. His peace fills us. His protection is over us. His provision is enough. We see it. We realize it. The power to overcome that is within us, that is the Holy Spirit. We realize that. His promises and that he's always faithful. He's never not. 
and his providence that he's over it all. And even if we don't understand the moment, we know he has the story in his hand. And the perspective that he can give us so that we can see light, that we can see life, that we can see hope, that that continues to come alive in us. That's powerful stuff. That's the power of belief and knowing that Jesus is the Christ and finding the life through that belief. is That's how we find that presence that we were created for, to be with God, to have that kind of intimate relationship of him filling us. Body, soul, mind, spirit. God everywhere. The problem that we're kind of diving into today is the context. Kind of the key, and the context is the key with Jesus' teachings. That's why it was these explanations in the settings, and you have to know the setting to understand what was really being said through um, Jesus' story or how he was explaining things. That context is key, and you could even say Jesus' primary teaching context, if we're going to be honest, and just think about it for about three seconds, and then you'll be like, oh, dang, that's so true. Jesus' primary teaching context is crisis. Amen? Right? When have you learned the most about God? When are the moments that you come closest to him? When do you want him most? When do you need him most? When do we turn to him? When do we let go of everything else that we've grabbed a hold of or that we've got a, a grip on? That it's, it's like, oh my gosh, it's crisis. The classroom of Jesus, you could almost say, is crisis and crisis moments. I think I've been pretty transparent over the course of this series about my own personal crisis in this season. I, I'm definitely going through crisis. Things are changing. About uh, two or three Mondays ago, I was reading an article then, uh, just out of a, based off a leadership podcast and just following up with reading the article that went with it. And the stuff, the title of the article was close to what's really going on behind the scenes that's causing you to feel the way you feel. And the, you know, the headline is crisis. Why you are in crisis, but you may not actually know it. What's going on behind the scenes that is really causing that crisis, even if you're trying to pretend you're not. This is what has happened, and it had kind of the context of the last year or year and a half in mind, which everyone, raise your hand if you're in this room. Yeah, that's who's been in crisis over the last year, whether you want to or not, because you don't get to define the definition of crisis. Crisis is this, and it has these six things that are really what crisis is and what crisis does. And again, I think we can connect it to the, what a good learning lab that becomes to learn about Jesus and to figure out these things of life. So here's six things. Number one, here's what crisis does. Crisis destroys your methods. That's why, actually, again, it's a good teaching arena. Crisis ruins the way you were operating. It, it ruins your, your norms. It, it, it ruins your behaviors that you do. I was using this word under the bridge last night at the message. It, like We all are coping, basically, every day. We're coping with methods and ways and things. When we get up, what we do when we first get up, what we do after we do what we do when we first get up is what we do second. Like all those things, what we do before bed, what we hope happens in the, the, the definition of a good day. All of those things, whether you know it or not, you've got methods. There's things that you love to happen in the way that they happen. And what crisis does is it destroys that method. It disrupts the method for what you love to call normal or what you love to call comfortable, or what we love to call like purpose, or for real, like just even safety and uh, security, basic human need. Like our methods, we do things every day. We, the life you are currently leading is your best attempt at being secure and being safe and feeling like you, you love, are loved and you belong and that you have purpose and that you have significance. That's all method. Isn't that like an interesting way of thinking? Like your methods are what you do to keep that sense of, A, you know, it can be closeness to God and that relationship and whatever that is. But in this bigger story, crisis destroys those methods in our life, and that's so disruptive. Number two, crisis sets your mind in perpetual motion. 
Like, that's what happened. That's, you can't stop thinking. And it makes sense with, because your methods got disrupted. You're looking for new methods. How do I cope? How do I get along? What is normal? How do I feel what I felt from how I could live before that I now can't live? And obviously the pandemic is such a good example, but like any day, so many of us, any season of life, that's kind of my deal. That's why I'm in crisis. It's, it's a life season. Methods are disrupted. And my mind is searching for how do, how do I get back? How do I keep that feeling? How do I keep those relationships alive and to have the meaning that I believe they're supposed to have? My mind, you just start, when your method goes out the door, you're looking for something new. How do you feel that? How do you think that? Again, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, it's all fair game. Crisis destroys our methods. Crisis sets your mind in perpetual motion. Crisis blurs your boundaries. Like our methods and then like our patterns, they set like the boundaries of our life, again, to where we feel normal. They suddenly blur. And again, the pandemic is a good one. The blurred lines are like, man, when I was home, I was home. When I was at work, I worked. But now I work at home and at home I work. That's confusing. Or school, right? The, the boundaries start to, like, what you do to feel normal and what the normal routines or the methods were, those are just because the boundaries shift. I used to do school at school, and when I was home, I would be home. Occasionally, I'd have homework where I do schoolwork at home, but that's called homework. What if all I do is work, school, at home all the time? Your method to sanity, your, your, your method to peace, your method to experiencing all the peas of God's presence and his power and his provision, that's all getting messed with when your life gets messed up from something. Sickness, death, loss of a loved one, career change, career transition, loss of a job, just bad news, how that can affect us. Man, so many, so many different things, but the blur of boundaries happens in crisis. And that's what's going on behind the scenes. And all we're thinking about is how we feel and what we want, but did that make sense? Number four, crisis causes us to become overloaded. They're kind of stacking on each other, right? But that makes sense because you can't shut your mind off and the boundaries that you use to shut your mind off or at least to shift gears, those are no longer there. You're on overload. How you filter and how much you know, information and how you process all that, it can't happen the same way. That's why I, really all the leadership stuff that I uh, listened to over this last year, all the discipleship stuff is like how people know how stressed they are. That is the, what's going on. They're in crisis. They're trying to, they're, we're made to try to operate as if we're not, but you are. Your method's being disrupted. How are you handling it? Number five, crisis creates busyness. Did you hear this line over the, the break of like, man, basically the fundamental rule is you can't do anything, you can't go anywhere kind of stuff, but everybody got busy doing nothing. That, that was like part of the crisis and the stress because it's a mind thing and it's a boundary thing and all. And there, there was like the activity level of life was so high and yet you couldn't do anything. There were, there's like a war in this crisis that's taking place because of it. Number six, crisis creates confusion about who is in control or crisis creates confusion about how control happens and ultimately the, the point in the article is pointing to in crisis you forget that you are still in control every yeah everything changed and everything was disrupted and turned upside down but it's you who decide how you respond to that, ultimately, that determines to what degree of, and what effect, and like we talk about a lot around here, who and how you become when that crisis hits you. There, there's a, a choice in that, in what Jesus is doing in discipleship all the time. This is what Jesus is doing with his disciples then. Anybody a Christ follower today? The, the norm of Jesus in our lives is to create crisis, see how we respond, and do we respond knowing he is the way, knowing he is the truth, and knowing he is the life, no matter what's going on. 
And it's crazy because it becomes what we're start to filter is what are the things we're leaning on or we're leaning into or we're letting take that place that God wants to be in our life. What do we lean to for presence or that sense of presence and peace and protection and power and his provision? What are those things we're leaning to that the lesson that Jesus is teaching or the classroom he's teaching in is in this crisis so that this filter has to take place? The word we're diving into is John chapter 14. The setting really comes from John chapter 13. That is kind of where this crisis is building and comes from that then Jesus starts talking to them in John 14 about that crisis or starts asking them and talking to them, teaching them in that kind of a moment. But at the heart of it, crisis creates chaos. And what you believe in chaos determines your life. That's another way of saying what the purpose of the book of John is about. Crisis creates chaos, and what you believe in chaos determines your life. What do you believe when it all goes wrong? The power of belief, remember that? The power of belief, what degree do you live for that? Do you stake your life on that? In chaos, which is created by crisis, like what you believe and how convinced and the power to which you, you put your belief in that is going to determine your life. It's kind of the storyline and, and what Jesus is really bringing across here. But check this out. Um, the Life Application Study Bible gives some notes about John chapter 13 through John chapter 17. This is what it says. John chapter 13 through 17 reveals what Jesus said to his disciples on the night before his death. These words were all spoken in one evening when, with only the disciples as his audience, he gave the final instructions to prepare them for his death, his resurrection, and the events that would change their lives forever. Welcome to, like, a learning lab of crisis. He's telling them, you're going to need new methods. Your brain's going to become overloaded. Your boundaries, they're all going to blur. Because basically what you thought was going to happen is not going to be the story. I got a different story. It goes a different way. Jesus loves this context of crisis as his classroom because it causes us to search for that. What do we really believe in that moment? What is really true? So again, th get this picture. This is the night before. They followed him for three and a half years. They still haven't figured him out. And this, the news and the information he's about to lay out for them does not make any sense to them. It doesn't make any sense to do for what is about to happen to take place. And if it does, then, then what will give about their life? What will be normal? What can we expect? The things we've been hoping for, you just said, aren't going to happen the way we wanted them to happen. That's kind of important to understand as chapter 14 opens up because Jesus says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Be troubled. Because he just told them incredibly troubling information. And that, that's a little bit humorous to me, you know? Now, don't be troubled. Do you think they needed to hear that? Because he just disrupted you know, what they've been given their life to for the last three and a half years. And the setting that he does this is crazy. In chapter 13, he washes their feet. That blew their mind. That Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, that he washed their feet. That, that, that was disruptive enough. And if you read the story, how the disciples reacted, they didn't want him to do that. They wanted to wash his feet. He said, no, I wash your feet. That turned their world upside down. Jesus then goes on to say, one of you who wants to wash my feet don't even want me to wash your feet. You're going to betray me. And that, that's like in a, in a small setting with a few people that he brings that information. That's disruptive. Like everyone starts questioning everyone's motive and heart and like why they're a part of the group and who is the one that's going to do that. Then he tells Peter he's going to deny. And here, here's like, this is what blew my mind. I heard someone explaining the night before Jesus was to die, this was the time of Passover. And what they were supposed to get together to celebrate was Passover. 
for probably most of us in this room or most of us listening, the closest thing to what Passover meant and how meaningful it was to them would be our Christmas mornings. Like, I bet in this room, and again, listening, that most of us have the most ritual patterns, traditions. We love things the way they, they've always been because that's what brings the meaning to Christmas for us in our lives. This is like Jesus showing up on your Christmas morning and saying, it's not going to go the way that you usually celebrate it. That, that, that he was like ruining that they wanted to get together for this meaningful Passover uh, tradition is kind of what they had in mind, again, from some of those notes I was reading. And then um, instead, he washes their feet, he brings this news across, and they're sitting around the table breaking bread together in that setting. And he follows that with this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Even though I just dropped a hand grenade in the middle of our relationships and setting in your life. This is what he follows that with. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Like, I, I know that doesn't go with anything that you were thinking and what you thought. And I know you dropped everything to follow me and you've done that for three years. And this is new information. But hang on a second. Don't lose your mind. Don't lose your life. Don't quit. Don't go away. Don't get depressed. Don't, don't go anywhere. You believe in God. Again, I've showed you how to believe in God. That's what's important right now. Believe also in me. The disciples were in crisis. Their lives were uh, being turned upside down. And Jesus was calling them to belief. He, in a sense, led them into crisis and then is like, now believe. That's so important. Chapter 14 goes on, verse 2. My father's house has many rooms. He's trying to, like, how can I help them not be troubled? How can I help their belief? Let me really explain some things I've explained to them. Let me tell them the story we've been living again and see if this helps bring them back to the belief. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you? Right? My, my father, what we believe, what I've showed you about who he is and what his heart is like and the difference of my life in him and him in my life and who we are, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back, and I'll take you to be with me, and you will also be, then be where I'm in, I am uh, at, because it's about presence, like that sense of presence in me and you and you and me, like I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. That's where the peace comes from. It's about that. That's what we believe. That it's about presence that brings peace, that brings protection, that brings provision. You know the Father. He was assuring of the, him, them of that. I've shown you his kingdom and how his kingdom operates and that it's upside down. That we're supposed to love him and we're supposed to love people. And the people we're supposed to love are like those that are hurting those that are disadvantaged and those that are marginalized or pushed to the side. We're supposed to live our lives for them. I know what I just got done telling you is disruptive to everything about your life, but believe in God. You know who he is. Live out the life he calls you to. Verse 5. This isn't making sense to them. They're, they're not like, they don't have a grip of that. They're interacting with him in this uh, setting of him trying to explain and help them understand. Verse 5 says, Thomas said uh, to him then, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Like, I'm, I don't exactly get what you're saying. I'm looking for something more physical. Like, are you talking about a physical place that you're going? And the, to be honest, he's like, yeah, well, kind of because of eternal life and stuff like that, but I'm talking about right now. I am talking about right now and how you get to where you are right now with presence and peace and that sense within you. I'm talking about your heart and your soul and your mind. That's where you need this. That's where the power of belief ultimately lies for your life. Jesus answered him, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me to get in this kind of space that my presence takes over, brings comfort to you in your life, brings that, that peace that only comes through me. 
That's how you get to the Father. That's how you get to that relationship. That's how you get to this level of belief. It's belief in me that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 7, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him because you've seen him. Like his heart and what he's about in his kingdom, it's come through my life. It's the story you've been living in. It's the story you can keep living out. You know this, remember this, hold on to this way of living. This is going to be so important in the days ahead. Again, because he's about to be crucified, die, get buried, and then he's going to raise again, hang out with them for another minute, but then charge them with being the body of Christ in this world for now and forevermore. Verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. And that will be enough for us then. If it's the Father you want us to see, like, so actually show him to us, that will be enough. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you uh, for such a long time, do you not get this yet? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I'm not getting that you don't get this. Can't you, you feel this in your life? Verse 10, don't believe, um, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The operative word in that sentence is believe. Don't you believe this? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, they're, they're from the Father. He's living in me. He's doing this work that you've seen. The power of the life and how relationships and how people have been healed through my life and how they found, you know, all this... Um, power and the protection and the miracles that have happened, that's from the Father through me. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe uh, on the evidence of the work themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I am doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may continue to be glorified through the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Jesus is ultimately just saying the power of your belief in this to be true and the power for you to live this story out as your life is what this is all riding on. Belief is ultimately like faith and trust. That was the prayer we started kind of this series with. Putting our, If we believe this, we put our faith and our trust in God being all of this in our lives. And the reality of our lives in crisis is when we know it the most is we need something outside of ourselves that brings this to all be true. It's not going to happen from within us in just a search of our own interior. We need something outside of ourselves to bring that presence, to bring that peace, to bring the protection of our heart and our soul and our mind, to be the provision, to be the power, to put our full faith in the promises of God that we know are true, but to continue to live a life that believes that and his providence and his perspective setting in. It's through belief that that happens. The degree to which we stake our lives on living that out and knowing that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And that through that, that that's a claim of ours. That's not his claim. That's our claim that we find that life that he has created us for. John 20, verse 30 through 31. That was, our, again, the purpose statement of the book of John. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that were not recorded in the book of John, but that it was what he was always doing, these powerful, life-transforming things in lives. They couldn't all be written down, but the ones that were, verse 31, but these were all written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Psalm 91, 
verses 1 and 2. This was just a devotion, like quiet times, uh, personal Bible reading this week. It was what popped up on my phone um, in the app that I was using. And I just was like, man, this, this is what we're talking about. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Whoever believes in the name of Jesus will find the life that we were created for, will find the peace, will find the comfort. That's the shadow of the Almighty that we were created to be in. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God in whom I trust. And I was like, that, that is what this series has been about for me, is seeking that and seeking to live like that. Seeking to grow my belief and the degree to which I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that I can, be, I can be like this, that I can dwell in the shelter of the Most High no matter what is going on, that I may be in the shadow of the Almighty so that His presence is in me and I am in Him, and to take refuge. And what that means to take refuge is to have that belief and let that belief surface and all that we are, everything that we are in this life. So I think, man, that the challenge to believe, isn't that, I mean, that sounds kind of funny. The challenge, though, is to believe, put our faith and our trust that Jesus is the Christ and that through our belief in him that our life will come more alive no matter what's going on, no matter what we're going through, That's, that's our call as the church. That's our call as Christ followers, as disciples, being disrupted just so that we can reclaim that and live that much more of a powerful life in him and through him and for him in these days. So let's pray um, together here this morning. Father God, thanks um, for this morning. Thanks for letting us get together like this. Thanks for your work in our body. More and more of us realizing the part that we can be how to lead the life that you're calling us to, how to get our lives in the word and your word in our lives. And all that gives us a better chance at deeper belief, greater commitment to know um, that you are the one, you are the way, you're the truth, you're the life that leads us. Help us just do that more and more and more and more in the days ahead. We thank you, we love you. We love one another. We love this community. And we just pray for you to become more and more and more and more known. In Jesus' name, amen. And now as we prepare to head out into the rest of the week, the rest of the game, the rest of the church, let's pray again with eyes wide open, hearts continuing to be open, and hear this benediction. Benediction says, With so many voices clamoring for your attention and devotion, may the Lord's truthful presence banish any and all confusion, distraction, error, and doubt from your minds and hearts. May the purity of his truth keep you from copying the behavior and adopting the flawed values of this world. May the God of all truth transform you into a new person by correcting the way you think and purifying the way you live. May you rest in the reality that God's will, is, will for you is and always shall be good and pleasing and perfect. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you all are sent out. Have a great week.